Your papers, please. In New Hampshire is dead. New Hampshire citizens have spoken. HB 685, prohibiting our participation in Real ID, was passed in 2007 and defiantly signed by our own Governor Lynch. Your privacy and autonomy are safe. Except, nobody told the New Hampshire Senate, apparently. In a bold move, the Senate has amended an unrelated bill, SB 434, to revive, resurrect, reanimate the possibility of New Hampshire accepting a national ID card in direct contravention to the demonstrated will of their constituents, not to mention codified law. What does it take these days for government to do what it's told? Ask Dick Cheney. Two-thirds of Americans say it's not worth fighting. So? So? You, you're not, you don't care what the American people think? No. Following the amended bill's rushed introduction and unanimous passage, it's now in front of the House Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, March 24, 2008. Let's go hear the arguments all over again, shall we? Ah, memory lane. Jen Coffey, driving force behind protecting New Hampshire sovereignty. What's going on here? Uh, essentially, this is a repeat of how Real ID got passed in the first place, which is where it had no public hearing, and it was attached to a bill that had nothing to do with Real ID. What our Senate did was basically put in an amendment to try and coerce our governor into asking for an extension, and also asking our congressional delegation to intercede, which I guess they haven't been watching because uh, Sununu has been actively trying to get Real ID repealed for the last two years. What we're trying to do today is to make sure that this amendment is removed from the bill that it's been attached to that has absolutely nothing to do with real ID. It's actually an electronics bill. It has to do with communications. And we're asking the House to pull that language out and or simply kill the entire bill. Is it worth the time? No. At this time, I will open the public hearing on um, Senate Bill 434 and call on the prime sponsor, Senator <coughs> Harold Janeway. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Harold Janeway, representing the 19 towns of Senate District 7. As the chair voted on the prime sponsor. This bill started life as a uh, straightforward piece of legislation introduced at the request of the Attorney General. Uh, the purpose of this is to uh, essentially catch our statutes up with the fast-moving uh, technology of communications services. Um, RSA 7, column 6 uh, gives the AG, the authority to wish, issue administrative subpoenas to get certain types of information from telephone, cell phone, internet service providers when there's reasonable ground to believe that the service has been, is being, or may be used for unlawful purposes. And the Office of the Attorney General uses this authority most commonly when investigating crimes involving the internet, for example, sale of, sale of child pornography, luring children for a sex activity over the internet. And the statute allows uh, the Attorney General to issue subpoenas to, quote, communications common carriers, which used to include all internet service providers. However, uh, based on a U.S. Supreme Court opinion, that term is not all encompassing and does not reach companies like Comcast, which is now a significant provider of uh, telephone services. Obviously, when this bill was written, nobody thought that cable companies would be providing phone services. So that's why this needs to be caught up. So essentially, what, what this legislation does is to amend the statute to use a more all-encompassing term, uh, which you'll see, which is providers of electronic communication services or remote computing services. And that language is in sync with the um, federal statute. So that's the uh, easy and straightforward part of this bill. Um, however, on the 
Senate floor on uh, February 21st, an amendment uh, was added, which is presumably why you have such a turnout here this afternoon. And that amendment um, <coughs> essentially um, asks the governor uh, to apply for an extension from the federal government deadline, which I believe is May 11th of this year, um, for compliance of the Real ID Act. <coughs> and it, it goes on, as, as the amendment does, that this request shall not constitute participation in Real ID uh, in violation of our own state law. And the, the governor or his designee we're directed to request assistance of our wonderful New Hampshire federal delegation in obtaining this extension. So the logic is not clear as to why this is here, but I guess that's the Senate's prerogative to do such things on the fly, which was done. So I think others will be explained, will be able to explain more of the details on that than I can. I'm sort of the innocent carrier of the uh, original bill, so my name is still on it. Um, and there may be someone from the AG's office who can elaborate on what I've said or answer the questions that are better directed to them than to me. May I uh, call on members first to address the portion that does not pertain to real ID? If you have questions, Senator that I know that. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this says that the Attorney General can request this information. When, when the Attorney General requests this information, is there a court order involved, or just does the Attorney General just say, I want this, this, and this? Uh, if Ann Rice is here and is going to testify, um, she'd be in a better position to answer that. I don't think it does require that. But she probably should even go that far. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for taking my question. Uh, regarding the, again, the, first, the first part of the bill, uh, are these changes that, that basically extends the, the net over communication providers different than what they might encounter in other states? In other words, is New Hampshire looking for something? that we don't have to do in, in other states yet? Again, it would be better to ask that question if someone knows more. I know that, that Comcast appeared in support of the bill. It was in full support of the bill. I should have mentioned that. That's the best I can do. Representative Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, perhaps you can help us with the scope of the problem. Why is the bill reduced? How many problems? What dollar value? People involved? Well, all I can say is that a significant amount of telephone traffic is now done over, through, and by cable. So the net is not, has a sizable hole. I don't know whether it's 10% you know, of telephone traffic. Or it's, it's, it's a significant hole. <laughs> Complaints, level of complaints on this? Uh, I, I have pointed the vote. No data on that, so I don't know. But it's clear that our law needs to be in sync with the, uh, the federal definition, which it is not now. So that's why the AG made the request it was making. Representative Thomas has a question. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you. And uh, I just have a question, uh, you know, just quickly, if you don't know what coming. Uh, I'm looking at, at, at 570, RSA 570A1. Do you know how, that's what that's what the language was in Section 1. Uh, do you know, uh, our Roman one, I should say, do you know if, how close that is to the U.S. The idea was to get it in sync, I so I assume it would be close. Any further questions of Senator Jane? Did you 
want to follow up with you yeah, time? Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, if I may, to the committee, this is providers of electronic communication services. That's why I'm, I'm, I get uh, U.S. Code 18 for us and 570, even though it's stricken. I don't think all the remote computing services. Because <coughs> well, computing, computing services is an electronic communication service. I was told that that's the language that's used in this federal statute. Okay. So it might be redundant, but it's there. Thank you. Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, I don't, um, <clears throat> I'm new to the committee, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to feel my way around here. But I don't understand why the carriers in, this, in your bill are exempt from prosecution if they provide uh, uh, personal information about <coughs> individuals. Should, who, who, in other words, I don't understand enough about the legislation, but who is liable if information about somebody is re released and it shouldn't have been, or there was no just cause to have released it? Again, that would be better directed to the Attorney General's office. I'm sorry to be a basic, uh, I don't know to say I don't know. Representative, are, are you, did you want to follow up? No, I think. Representative Gary. If I may, I, I have the U.S. Code right here. I can read those two definitions. They're very short. Uh, the first definition is 25, uh, 2510, paragraph 15, electronic communication service means any service which provides to users thereof the ability to send or receive wire or electronic communications. The second one is the term remote computing service means the provision to the public of computer storage or processing services by means of an electronic communications system. So, there you go. All in real time. Yep. Because <laughs> I have remote computing service. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not being watched. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, protocol on uh, representatives, but in the interest of resolving uh, this issue with regard to um, uh, the real ID portion of this bill, I will instead call on Mike Delaney from the governor's office just to bring us up to speed on the history behind the Real ID portion, which is my understanding will be taken up by another committee. So uh, once we've heard from him, I will probably make an announcement to all of you who are here for that portion that you might better address your comments to the second committee, and that will only be after uh, hearing in this committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Michael Delaney, um, and I have the pleasure of serving as legal counsel to uh, Governor Lynch. Um, I was asked to come over just to provide some background on the, the Real ID section of the legislation um, that has been inserted into this bill. Um, I can tell you that the Department of Safety and the Governor's Office have been um, actively uh, involved in this issue um, during the past month. By way of brief history, uh, most of you will recall that last session under 2007 Chapter Law 243, uh, the General Court passed a law prohibiting participation in the federal real ID program. Um, that was overwhelmingly supported by the General Court. I think the vote in the House was 268 to 9, and the Senate passed the bill 24 to 0. Um, one of, the, one of the complaints at the time um, that last year's bill was being addressed, um, among the complaints that have been raised regarding the Real ID program, was when it was passed uh, into law by the federal government, the, the Real ID Act of 2005. 
there were no federal regulations at all that had been promulgated, promulgated to specifically identify what the states were actually going to have to do in connection with this federal program. Um, finally, um, it, on January 10th of 2008, the federal government finally promulgated its rules that um, were designed to carry forth the federal policy established in the, the Federal Legal ID Program in 2005. Um, in those federal rules that came out in January of this year, the federal, federal government set up a series of, of benchmarks and deadlines in connection with that federal program uh, that the state of New Hampshire and, and many other states across uh, the nation had, had rejected uh, by way of legislation. The most relevant immediate date was a May 11th, 2008 deadline, which was a date uh, in which the federal government basically said if the states had not requested an extension uh, from the federal government for starting to comply with the Real ID program, <coughs> that there would be some secondary screening measures that would be put in place um, in airports um, for those citizens that carried driver's licenses from non-compliant states. So essentially, pursuant to the federal rules, uh, the states uh, were required uh, by March 1st of 2008 to seek an extension of the May 11th deadline um, if they did not want these secondary screening processes to, to occur. Uh, most states um, filed, filed uh, some form of request of the federal government um, seeking an extension. Consistent with our state policy as promulgated by um, the general court, um, the, the Office of the Governor in the state of New Hampshire um, simply were not in a position to seek an extension for the purpose of complying with the Real ID program because as a matter of policy we, we rejected that program. Um, but we also felt it appropriate to, to let the Department of Homeland Security know that we did not want our citizens um, to face the onerous burdens of the program by May 11th. So on February 25th um, of this year, Governor Lynch sent a letter to Secretary Chir Chertoff uh, describing the state law that had been passed last year and asking the federal government not to impose the, um, the, the additional screening requirements um, on the Hampshire <coughs> citizens uh, come May 11, 2008. Uh, we have not yet received an official uh, response from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we are hopeful that we will receive a response um, fairly shortly. Um, other states that have similar laws and have been um, seeking uh, not to have these requirements imposed on their citizens <coughs> have also been filing letters and have been receiving responses. So in that regard, we do believe we have it under control. The most recent update is the state of Montana that is similarly situated in terms of a law to New Hampshire on Real ID um, sent a letter uh, last week uh, seeking uh, an extension. Uh, and they were granted one um, last week. Uh, so we do see that as a good sign uh, that the federal government um, is uh, leaning towards telling those citizens in, in states that are not going to comply with Real ID that this May 11th <coughs> deadline um, won't, uh, won't apply. Um, this week we have followed up on our February 25th letter, um, sending uh, a, a letter very consistent with the approach that the state of Montana uh, took in terms of what they had submitted to the federal government. Um, I do not have an estimate of when, uh, exactly when we'll hear back from the federal government, but we are certainly hopeful that that will occur very soon. Um, so we do have the matter under active uh, management uh, in the executive branch, and, and that's the update that I bring to the committee today. Thank you for your time. Representative Fargo has a question. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think the committee might benefit from more detailed description of the contents of those letters. Um, it's my understanding that, that we were required to file an extension and what New Hampshire did was filed an exemption request. Yeah, the, the, the language of the, of the federal rule would uses the word uh, extension. Um, we did not use that word, nor, nor do, did, did we in any way file an extension um, on behalf of New Hampshire for the purpose of complying with, with this program. What we did is we sent a letter to Secretary Chir Chertoff requesting that the department not impose um, the 
onerous burdens of the screening requirement on the citizens of New Hampshire. Um, to be specific, uh, the actual letter that was sent was released publicly by our office. You can find it on the governor's website. So the exact wording of the letter that was sent is a matter of public record and can be found um, just by clicking on the governor's website. I apologize, I don't have that language before me, so I can't, I can't quote it for you. Thank you. Uh, along that line, is the, is the, second, there, is the second letter that was sent um, modeled after the Montana uh, request? Is that also available? Uh, that is not available <coughs> online yet, simply, I think, for, for reasons that it was just sent out yesterday. But it certainly um, can be made available in, in, in terms of your first question. Yes, it is modeled very closely along the lines of Montana's request. And I would also emphasize that Montana um, did not seek an extension for the purpose of complying with Real ID. It was as specific as New Hampshire was in stating an intention of not to comply with the final rules given that they have a state law that is consistent with New Hampshire state law. Representative Kalin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for coming. In your opinion, does this ask the governor to do anything that he hasn't already done? Um, I, I don't believe so. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Representative Thomas, I didn't see you. <coughs> thank you for letting share. Like the, uh, the letter that was sent, out, it's just a, a question requesting relief from the cost of it. Do you think that that's really strong enough? Or, or is, it, is it just trying to change the way they don't do it to us? Yeah, the, the letter that we sent um, was not directly related at all to the significant <coughs> debate over the costs of real ID. And, and I think. There has been, there's been a, a host of discussion about that. The letter that we sent was specifically tar targeted to this one particular federal regulation um, that was, was looking at a deadline on, on, as of May 11th that, that we thought was inappropriate. So our letter didn't address costs, but it simply wasn't intended to address that issue one way or the other. Thank you, Mr. Uh, again, Mike. Uh, did the letter... Did the letter at all mention that this bill and maybe others would be coming forward? The, um, uh, in terms of the bill that's before you yeah. at the time, yeah. uh, no, it did not mention this bill in any way. Representative Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, There's a concern about the, ver or the word extension versus exemption. Uh, would it be appropriate for us to change that in here and say to apply for an exemption from the federal deadline rather than an extension of? Uh, um, certainly, um, we have not we have not used that word in the letter we have sent. So, to the extent that the general court um, uh, did did not want did not want that word to be used, um, you certainly could consider uh, amending the language. I, I would repeat my other statement: is I, I don't know that as a whole, um, sort of the, the, the sentiment that's expressed, expressed in this request hasn't already been, been carried out by the executive branch. And just to maybe curtail this line of questioning, it is my intent to ask this committee to direct all of its attention toward the original bill and to leave for the next committee the deliberations regarding the Real ID Act. And so the reason I called on Mr. Delaney <coughs> to explain this to us was to give us the background, but not have us on this committee try to uh, micromanage or even change the portion that was tacked on in the Senate, which to my mind is not germane. But uh, Did you want to speak to that, Representative Garrett? Yeah, we might be able to wrap it up. I can read the letter, it's two, it's two lines. And then we don't have to ask questions about the letter anymore. Is that okay? And it may have come from this gentleman's pen. Very well done. Uh, dear Secretary Chertoff, on behalf of the State of New Hampshire, pursuant to 6 CFR Part 37.63, I request that New Hampshire driver's licenses continue to be acceptable as identification by federal agencies for official purposes after May 11, 2008. 
As you know, the state of New Hampshire adopted legislation prohibiting participation in any driver's license program pursuant to the Real ID Act of 2005 or in any national identification card system that may follow there from. C-2007, New Hampshire Laws, Chapter 243. This request is not an indication of our state's intent to comply with the Real ID final rule. We appreciate your attention to this matter. Very truly yours, John H. Lynch, Governor. More than two sentences, but nevertheless, quite to the point. Thank you. Are you satisfied, Representative Barry, that you've had an opportunity to... Each of us will be on the floor of the House to vote on this ultimately, but I do believe this is the purview of another committee to the real ID portion. Unless someone wants to challenge me on that, we'll... We'll move ahead, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What is the request? I I'm not even certain. I have that. Oh, Representative know. Foster, do you know which committee will hear this next? Which one? I do. Can you tell us, please? Uh, it would concern licensing, so it goes to transportation. Thank you. Ed? Just a question. Sir, have we ever taken a bill where there has been a non germane piece tacked onto it and not discussed it with the entire bill? I do not remember that happening. And, and so you suggest. Well, I'm just wondering. I, I don't know. You have a Original bill or the uh, that piece is the ID piece of it, and if we're holding a piece a hearing on the bill, forgive me, it, it would seem to me that we would be holding a hearing on the entire bill and not a piece of the bill. And I know that's going to extend things, but I have never seen us curtail a hearing on the second piece of the bill. And I, is that your intent? It seems like a practical solution in this case, but I will not deny people the opportunity to speak on any portion of it, including Representative Barry, if he wanted to pursue his line of questioning, because we, each of us and every member of the public certainly has, has the right to, uh, to be heard. Okay. Um, with that, then, as a <coughs> backdrop, I will recognize Representative Kirk. Thank you, Madam Chairman. For the record, I'm Neil Kirk, representing Hillsborough District 7, the towns of Goffstown and Ware, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon before this committee. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about both sections of the bill, if I may, Madam Chairman. Section 1 deals with the expansion of an existing law, which I think is um, undesirable. That is to say, both the expansion and the original law. Basically, we have given the Attorney General, and through her, all the Assistant Attorney Generals, and through her, all the County Attorney Generals, and through her and them, all the Assistant County Attorney Generals, which is many, many, many people. The power, based on their determin determination that they have reasonable grounds for belief that the particular kind of communication service is being furnished to a person or location that has been, is being, or may be used for an unlawful purpose. Having made that determination, the individual who's made that is entitled to go to the communications carrier, and as it's expanded, which I'll get into in a minute, more communication carriers than currently, to get all of the information you see listed on lines 11 through 25, including the names and address uh, to whom the any telephone number is assigned that's relevant to the inquiry. Um, the local and long distance telephone connection records, in other words, um, the fact that I called my oncologist or I called my psychiatrist or anybody else or any of my friends, they will know. Anybody I call, they won't know the, the content of the conversation. That they can't do yet without a true court order. Uh, but based on an administrative subpoena, which is what we're talking about, 
they can determine all of my contacts by telephone, related or not to the purpose of their inquiry. Um, they not only get to whom I call, but the amount of time I spend and um, when I made the call. Um, they also get information about the types of service I have from the company. Um, and they've expanded it on line 23 to include any network addresses that I might be talking to or own. And most offensive, lines 24 and 25, they now are going to get my bank account number and my credit card number if I use those to pay for these services. Now, currently, and they don't change this, the organizations, the communications providers that give this information up are exempt from lawsuit. You know, there's a big hubbub in Washington about this, but let's recognize there's a difference. In Washington, they're talking about retroactive immunity. Here, it's prospective immunity, not retroactive. <coughs> They've always had exemptions here. Um, so to answer some of the questions that were raised before, um, carelessness apparently Anne Rice from the Attorney General's office may contradict me and please believe her rather than me on this issue because she knows more. Uh, it, it looks as though uh, somebody else's mistake, I suffer and have no legal redress. Whether it's a communications uh, provider or the Attorney General's office. I would ask you to look at this not just from the narrow technical point of this committee, that is to say, the issue of expanding an already existing program, I would ask you to determine whether the existing program ought to be continued and not expanded. I would have thought that portion of the bill would have gone secondarily to the Judiciary Committee. Representative Foster said because of the Real ID piece, it probably will go to transportation. But there are really three committees that have an interest in this because it is a bifurcated bill. And although the two don't have anything to do with each other, I don't think we technically call this non-germane because it came over from the Senate as one piece. So, as to part one, this to me is an unacceptable expansion of information that goes to the state based on reasonable grounds for belief. When I think the correct standard ought to be probable cause and the order ought to come from a court. I know that makes it harder to fight crime, but the balance here is between fighting crime and privacy. And in that case, you folks know, all know where I stand. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, of course, is to completely eliminate Section F in any event, which is new, something they don't have now, and gives them more information about me. Basically, they want to collect a lot of information on criminals. And by the way, if it turns out that I'm innocent, they don't get rid of the information. Nothing in here that says they have to cleanse their records for every case where uh, it's been turned out that they don't need this information for prosecution. So for all I know, all of us have all sorts of information on file with the AG's office or some accounting attorney's office. Not, ha not a happy circumstance. So I would ask the committee to look not just at the technical issue of the expansion of services, but the policy of issue, issue as to whether or not this is good public policy in the state of New Hampshire. As to part two, Based on what Mr. Delaney said, I think this should be deleted, and although this committee may not wish to do so, I can assure you that somebody will move to divide the question on the floor, and I doubt if this will ever get to the next committee. So I would urge this committee to take the proper stance on this, even though it's technically none of your bailiwick. But this is so far out of line with public policy in New Hampshire. It's not necessary. The governor has already done whatever he wants to do and had the authority to do without this. Um, that I think you'd save the House a lot of trouble and make yourselves look like heroes if you simply eliminated the section. However, I understand the, the, the idea that one committee does not want to step on another committee's territory, and therefore I appreciate the sensitivity of the chairman in, in making her statement. And you have a tough call there. Good luck. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Representative Kelly. On section one, does this section bring us in line with the Homeland Security Act or provisions of it? Is that what it's attempted to do? I don't know that's what it's attempting to do. I think it does that, but I think this preceded Homeland Security. I think this is a power that 
has been held by the Attorney General's Office for many, many years. I think it's common in many states. Um, it's a nice crime-fighting tool, I have to admit that. But I think it goes too far. And whatever I can do to limit it, I would like to do. I don't want to tie their hands. I don't want to be robbed. I don't want my family to be mugged and, or, or killed or whatever it is that, that might happen. But I think there's a balance to be drawn. And I think um, I would prefer a higher standard of probable cause from a court rather than the lower standard of reasonable grounds for belief by an attorney general or even an assistant county attorney. Representative Hopper, then Representative Fargo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative uh, Kirk, I, I just asked for an opinion. Not, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> I was curious what you felt. There's in the uh, United States Constitution, New Hampshire Constitution, it, the citizens have a right to feel secure in their papers. And do you? It, when I read this, you know, like I said, I'm new to the committee, but when I read this, it, it felt as though if they can grab your Social Security number, your your uh, credit card number anytime they want, that you're really not secure in your papers, and this that, that this in and of itself is uh, a violation of people's constitutional rights. I would like to think that's the case, but it's my understanding that decades of law say that administrative subpoenas are constitutional, but I agree with your basic premise. It does make me nervous. It does make me feel less secure, and I don't think that in New Hampshire we should allow it, but I'm not going to say, and I don't know this for certain, that it's unconstitutional. Uh, one other point. I don't see anything in here which allows the gathering of Social Security numbers. That may happen, but I don't see that this is allowed under the terms of this bill. Not to say that common carriers have this information, but to the extent they do, there's nothing in here that would allow, as I see it, uh, the Attorney General to get that number. They can get my bank account number and my credit card number, but there's nothing in here that says they can get my Social Security number from the carrier, common carrier if they have it. Now, the AG may be able to get it directly from the federal government by some other mechanism, but I'm not aware of that. <coughs> Well, I just said thank you. Representative Cargo. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Kirk, for, for allowing the question. I actually have two questions, and, and one is sort of based on, on my lack of tenure in, the, in this position. There was discussion about where this, this should go, and you, you had suggested it should go perhaps to ju judiciary as well as, as transportation. In your vast amount of experience, I've seen occasionally where there's been joint committee work on, on bills. Would this be a, would you suggest that that might be an approach to form a joint committee gathering people from both judiciary and transportation for the next step? If I were chairman of the judiciary committee, I definitely would request that of the speaker that the next assignment be a joint one. Unless, of course, um, the House should eliminate section two from the bill, in which case I think it would go to judiciary. And the second question, um, I'm not real familiar with the uh, actions recently taken by the, the, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives and the Senate. I'm, I'm referring now to the FISA bill and the idea that, um, I guess in the latest write-ups, that, that uh, a subpoena would be necessary to, for a telecommunications company to receive or go out and get this information. Um, What's your understanding in, in terms of state laws that might be not consistent with federal laws when, when uh, looking at this with relationship to the I guess, pending act in, in, the, in the federal law? I wish I were in a position to answer that question, but I do not have sufficient knowledge of the bill in Washington to be able to respond uh, intelligently. Um, Ms. Rice may be able to answer that. Thank you, Madam Chair. But just trying to get some clarification on my own mind. It sounds like you said that this, this whole section is not needed, that the Attorney General currently has the, the power to gather the information he or she needs to prosecute somebody without this whole section? No. I 
hope I didn't give you that impression. This bill grants the Attorney General, by use of an administrative subpoena, powers that she currently has, if she chose to use them, through obtaining a um, court order. In other words, based on probable cause. She could get a search warrant, if she wished to do so, to get the same information. However, because that takes time, probably money, many states have given the attorneys general a shortcut. You can do this by an administrative subpoena. You don't have to prove the higher standard. You can just use reasonable grounds rather than probable cause. And I'm not saying that she has the power to do this without this bill. If you were to not just kill the bill, but if you were to repeal the sections, as I had suggested, then the Attorney General could continue to fight crime in the same way she is now, but she would have to go to court every time she wanted these records and with a higher standard of proof demonstrate probable cause and the court would issue a subpoena. This would result, obviously, in a more selective use of this power in only those cases where A, it was really needed, and B, they had the more they could meet the higher standard of probable cause would she, would she go. And they would argue this means that a lot of cases which we otherwise might be able to get information on and protect the public on will not occur. And that's the dilemma for us. You make it easy to get information, they probably can do a better job earlier on of fighting crime. You delay it to protect people's privacy, well, some things that we might not want to happen might because they didn't get information in a timely manner. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. Good luck with your deliberations. <laughs> uh, Representative Dan Etsy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have some things to say about the first part of the bill, and that's why I has to be recognized. Um, <coughs> first, I, I do have significant problems with the bill as presented. Um, there were references to our Constitution, and the Constitution allows the, for search and seizure when prosecuting criminal matters. And in that, in that view, I find the uh, line here, uh, common carrier has been, is being, or may be used, that, that uh, proscriptive measure that you know, maybe some crime will be committed using these services in the future as being highly problematic. It's not based on uh, knowledge that a, or suspicion that a crime is being committed or has been committed. It's that a crime may at some time in the future be committed. And that, to me, is, is extremely troubling. Um, it's kind of, it's very much an open door to really search anybody you want. Especially when it uses the vehicle of an administrative hearing. I, I find it very troubling when we allow the executive to do something that is normally reserved for the judiciary. Um, I don't like the idea of giving the same person that is charged with investigating crime the privilege of look, determining whether or not somebody's private, privacy needs to be uh, broached for that purpose. Um, that said, our Constitution does not prohibit it because it says, but in cases and with formalities as prescribed by law. And if we prescribe it by law that they can do it, then they can. So it's not strictly prohibited by our Constitution. But I do believe it is prohibited by our uh, historical practice and by the, the general ethos of our government. Um, so I, I would certainly move that you strike, <coughs> or maybe, from the existing law. I think I think any investigation of this sort should be limited to those cases where a crime has been or is being committed. I don't think we ought to leave that that open. So that's line ten. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, nine and ten. Uh, and I urge you to highly consider whether or not we ought to allow these administrative warrants. That said, the House has already approved this expansion of administrative warrants in the prosecution of uh, deadbeat dads. 
Now, that is, that is actually limited to cases where they know that somebody is not paying their child support. And it is for a very limited venue of crime. But we have done exactly that. I was the one person in the committee to vote against it. Again, because of my compunction over administrative hearings. I mean, administrative warrants. Now, having gotten the floor, I, I do object to the second part of the bill. Uh, mostly, I, I believe that we as a state have a right not to conform to this because it is not a power expressly delegated to the Congress of the United States of America. And that uh, in our ratification and in all the ratifications that uh, indicated an amendment in this area, they said they, they referred to powers expressly delegated to Congress. Everything else was reserved to the state. Nothing that was expressly delegated imparts any implication of such power. So we certainly have the right to say no. And I, I would uh, urge that we do. Secondly, uh, just the way the bill itself is worded, is applying for an extension for a deadline for compliance for something which we do not intend to participate in. And that is an oxymoron. I mean, I thought that I actually thought the governor's letter was very artful and simply asked for an exemption. That's appropriate. An extension for a deadline to which you do not intend to comply is nonsensical. And I, if you choose to do something about it, I wish you would. Any questions? Representative Kelly, that's I'm a little bit confused. I was late, I know, but. On this whole section of the bill. Which whole section? Uh, section one. To me, if I'm looking at it, part F, source of payment, credit cards, etc. Any of the other materials that I know of can be obtained by subpoena mm -hmm. uh, and by court order. Is yeah. it just the administrative warrant that you are upset about and yes. some of these additions? No, really just the administrative warrant and and the use of it for where no crime is, has been or is, is believed to be being committed. You know, just this kind of opened in in the future. There might be a crime there. Well, there might be a crime anywhere. That, that, I, that I object to. But, no, it's the, it's the administrative warrant that I really am uncomfortable with. It's, it's putting a whole power of one branch of government into the hands of another branch. It's not just a commingling, it's a real <coughs> transfer of power. So that in any of these records that would be available under a subpoena, you would have no, no, no. problem with, and that would include for civil litigation? Yeah. yeah. So subpoena is a subpoena. subpoena. They believe they something's believe there. Yeah. And no particular part of this bill is more egregious to you than others, no particular part of this section. assigned network addresses, having learned a lot about that recently, is a little <coughs> discomforting because you don't, that is a very, uh, hard web to weave to coin a phrase. Um, I just got a, a static IP and learned a lot about IP addresses and a temporarily assigned IP address is usually assigned only for about three days. So, unless somebody is really going through this with a fine tooth comb and knows when the IP address shifted from one person to another, you might be wrongfully accused of something. Thank you very much. And uh, the chair wishes to state that. I may have changed my opinion about 
reviewing the entire bill, and I do believe that we, ought, we as committee ought to weigh in before moving forward. So I don't want to discourage anyone out there from testifying. That being the case, however, I have allotted for today only one hour <coughs> of testimony. I will call on Representative Valancourt. Um, and my intent is to uh, resume these hearings at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. I know that may inconvenience some of those of you who have come out today. I didn't anticipate quite this uh, 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 lengthy a process, so I do apologize. But I, I also have the perception that many of you uh, signing in will be repeating what others of you have to say here today. So. Hopefully you can delegate this to someone else if you're not able to come back on another day. This time I will um, recognize Representative Valancourt. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Steve Valancourt. I represent Manchester, Ward 8, home of the Manchester, Boston Regional Airport. Um, and I thought I was here today because you got sick of talking about that guy named Reggie and wanted to talk about people like Emerson and Thoreau and Locke and Hobbes and Russo and civil disobedience and things like that. Uh, I did come to speak in particular about the section of the bill which uh, you thought originally you might not want to get into, but section two, the Real ID bill. And I guess I could throw even more confusion to the loop by saying that I'm not even sure it should be transportation or judiciary, but that the second committee might be state and federal relations. Because quite clearly, we've gone beyond the role of a driver's license and have come into the role where state and federal authority bump up against each other. But I, like Representative Kirk, believe that no matter what you do, the House will strip that section out and vote against it. Um, the great Roman orator Cicero said, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. I don't think any of us here want to be children, and with due respect to the governor's representative, I think he only told you part of the story about what occurred before we were here today. It is, of course, true that this House on a snowy day last year voted 268 to 9 to not comply with Real ID, but it didn't begin there. It began with one of the greatest speeches I have ever heard in my 12 years in the House three years ago when Representative Kirk got up on the floor and spoke, quoting, Patrick Henry from his Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech in which Patrick Henry took responsibility for the civil disobedience he was about to under, undertake. Uh, and in that vote, Representative Kirk managed to turn around, I believe it was a unanimous vote against getting out of real ID and the House overwhelmingly went for it. And then the Senate with Judd Gregg's people descending upon us. I met, remember they were stationed outside the Senate President's office, Senate President Gatsas at the time, talked the Senate into disobeying the will of the House, and the Senate affirmed Real ID. And then, of course, many of those senators were voted out of office. I'm not saying that was the reason why, but that's the story before the part that the governor's representative got to. Real ID, opposition to it, is in the history of New Hampshire, in the history of New England, and the shot heard around the world. But, you know, we shouldn't labor under the assumption that if we have civil disobedience, there will be no penalty. That's why, Representative Barry, I thought what you talked about was very important, whether the word is extension or exemption. I don't think I was befuddled by the governor's representative because he said that this is the same as what they've done. It's not the same. Clearly, line 16 uses the word extension here. If they are asking for an extension, it is changing the will of this body. You can't ask to extend something you've decided not to go along with. So this bill does not do what has already been done. If they've already asked for an exemption, fine. Hip, hip, hooray. If they're asking for an extension, they are overruling the will of this body, and I must say the will of the governor's own signature. You know, when um, talking about civil disobedience and the repercussions that derive from civil disobedience, I think you probably know of 
Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And Thoreau, of course, wrote the book on civil disobedience. He also wrote uh, Walden Pond. And he went to jail at one point for civil disobedience. And I believe his transcendental friend, and I, I know you wanted to get into political philosophy rather than Reggie, <laughs> but his transcendental friend Emerson came in and said, you know, Henry, what are you doing in there behind bars? And Thoreau's response was, Ralph or Waldo or whoever he called him, what are you doing out there? In other words, there comes a time that it's so important that you should stand up and you should say what you are doing is inherently wrong and we're going to defy you. We're going to defy you, George III, said Patrick Henry. We're going to defy you, federal government, said the citizens of New Hampshire with this bill. And tying this into the science <coughs> committee that you are, I thought there was probably one person that more than any other comes into this breach between science and political philosophy. And I handed you a little quote from a gentleman that probably reaches this, Albert Speer was the scientist of the Third Reich, the architect of the Third Reich. And whenever we talk about civil disobedience and the need for civil disobedience, we should talk about the Third Reich because there wasn't enough civil disobedience <coughs> there. But Albert Speer was the scientist. And just before he was sentenced to 20 years in Spandau prison, in 1946 he did serve the time and got out and lived another 15 years after that, by the way. And a lot of the uh, prosecutors at Nuremberg thought he was the best Nazi. But he warned the tribunal, and I think this comes into the junction between science and political philosophy, and I've kind of uh, highlighted it for you. He said, today the danger of being terrorized by technocracy threatens every country in the world. In five or ten years, the te technique of warfare will make it possible to fire rockets from continent to continent with uncanny precision. A new large-scale war uh, will prevent unfettered uh, will end the destruction of human culture and civilization. Nothing can prevent unfettered engineering and science from completing the work of destroying human beings. Obviously, he was talking about the nuclear holocaust that we have seen could well come about. But I think when you're talking in science in terms of putting a little chip in something that can follow my every movement and Big Brother can follow me from the time I leave my house in the morning to the time I get back at night, we can say to ourselves, yes, maybe we have the technology to do it, but do we want to do it? Do we want to do real ID? I think not. And I think it's important for those of us in New Hampshire to tell the rest of the country that. And since I quoted Cicero and Thoreau and other people, my favorite line in the English language comes from Shakespeare, and it's from the oration in Julius Caesar. And it says, um, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. I suggest if New Hampshire knuckles under to real ID, that evil will live after us. If we are able to successfully rebel against it, it'll be interred with our bones. But that would be a better place than having evil made manifest. I thank you, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chairman, and I suggest that People that are so scientifically oriented have the brain power to do with the philosophical, political arguments as well. <laughs> uh, Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere we see him in chains. Would you say that this is an electronic method of adding to the chains? Although I generally don't agree with Rousseau, because he was a champion of statism over individual rights, I think that quote he was accurate about. <laughs> but I'm very anti-Rousseau in other areas. I think he was one of the first fascist philosophers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I will... Uh, what's suspend, that's the word, suspend the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 434 to be resumed at 10 a.m. on a Thursday. I do thank everyone for coming, and if you can manage to come back on Thursday, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, to the extent that you have the same message as another person sitting next to you, perhaps you could consolidate your efforts. But thank you. Thank you.
and I'm very heartened by what I've heard from the committee. Uh, well, there you have it. First, it's not our concern, then, well, maybe it is. Still time to contact your committee members before they continue on Thursday at 10 a.m. and nhliberty.org. Help us do something about government.